Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our Summer at Seven program. This is the last program in the series tonight. And we're honored to have Dr. Gerald Horn and also to discuss a world icon, Paul Robeson. And, and folks from Connecticut, if you don't know, Paul Robeson, is someone, Paul Robeson is someone who made his home in Connecticut. He lived here in Enfield from 1941 to 1953. Most people know Enfield as a great place for shopping, but <laughs> so the uh, Connecticut history, we're quite honored that Paul Robeson did live here. And uh, unfortunately, many people don't know that. Um, well, I think it's important, this program tonight, why we chose it also um, discussing Paul Robeson. He's such a remarkable character. I mean, as one who has lived abroad, I lived in the Soviet Union, um, it was just remarkable how citizens remembered Paul Robeson. These were older folks, this was in the 80s, remembered his concerts and just, you know, think that people in other lands knew about Paul Robeson and so, so not known here due to political factors and others. And funny, my own family, um, my, my aunt lived in Moldavia, so you just remembered him and say, what a voice, how he so, spoke in Yiddish, such a polyglot. I'm sure Dr. Ron will be discussing that. Um, anyways, and as a library, we're, and as a librarian, I should say, it's just so great that we're bringing this to the fore and we're always happy, and myself as a librarian, that. When young folks come in who don't know about and ask about important people, figures in history, we can point them to the shelves and say, you know, why don't you um, look at the life of Paul Robeson and with Dr. Horn's work. We're very grateful and honored that this can grace our shelves, all our branches, mm -hmm. and I hope other librarians will are attending tonight will add that to their collection. Other people, of course, will buy the book. And I just want to make a note that folks who bought his book can contact me. <laughs> Um, because Dr. Horn will be signing book plates and we can send to you. So keep that in mind when you talk during the program. Joining us tonight, our co-host, co-sponsor, uh, Joel Fishman from the People's Center. My co-host, Marion Huggins, who is a branch librarian at uh, Mitchell Branch. And she is also in charge of our Urban Light Book Discussion Series, which is quite no been quite notoriety in New Haven. And my colleague, mm -hmm. Shannon Carter, will be doing technical. So I'm going to turn this over to Joelle. I'd like to say a few words about the People's Center and the wonderful work it does in Haven and our great collaboration. Thank you, Joelle. Well, thank you, Seth, and thank you to the Public Library for taking this great initiative. And um, it's just wonderful to welcome Dr. Gerald Horn back to New Haven once again, even if it is by Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we feel your presence in this city and we feel your presence at the New Haven People's Center. Um, the choice of Dr. Horn's book, Paul Robeson, The Artist is Revolutionary, could not be more timely. Paul Robeson was a fierce people's warrior for democracy against fascism. He, along with William Patterson, presented the petition, We Charge Genocide, to the United Nations in 1951, detailing the countless horrendous lynchings of black lives taking place in our country at that time. The great Paul Robeson could not be silenced when he was persecuted for embracing peace, justice, and socialism. And I'm really proud in a little corner of my life to have been part of the uh, student movement at Rutgers University. I edited the newspaper at, at Douglas College, the Kalian, in the 1960s uh, that waged a campaign and re to reclaim Paul Robeson's rightful legacy uh, as a four-letter sportsman, Phi Beta Kappa scholar, actor, and incomparable singer who inspired generations around the world. In 1949, when Paul Robeson was denied a concert hall, an outdoor concert was arranged in Peekskill, New York, and the Ku Klux Klan stood physically in the way. So, at the New Haven People Center, veterans returning from the fight against fascism during World War II were gathered from various cities in Connecticut and trained to protect Paul Robeson. They traveled to Peekskill and they surrounded him. He was called Paulie affectionately. They surrounded Paul Robeson the following week 
so that the concert could go on. However, there was only one trail out, one road out, and the Klan lined that road after the concert, and many of Robeson's supporters, including some from the People's Center, were injured on the way home when the Klan threw bricks and bottles at the cars as the police just stood by and looked on. So Dr. Horn, we look forward to your message today, and we look forward to a massive voter turnout on November 3rd to make sure that fascism does not take hold in our country and that the transformative moment underway today for peace, equality, social justice, workers' rights, for liberation and reparations can blossom and prevail. And so in conclusion, let me say that while limited activity has taken place in our building at the People's Center at 37 Howe Street during the pandemic, uh, the People's Center has been operating virtually and we have formed a jobs and unemployed committee in response to the needs of this pandemic depression. And if you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter or connect and ask any questions or express the need for assistance, uh, please email us at peoplecenter at pobox.com. I don't know, perhaps somebody will be able to put that in the chat. And so thank you again, New Haven Library, Public Library. And thank you, Dr. Gerald Horn, for your profound and tireless contributions. Thanks so much, Joelle. And now I'd like to bring on uh, Marion Huggins. We'll introduce Dr. Horn, my colleague. Dr. Horn, welcome to New Haven again um, over Zoom. We are so appreciative and happy that you're here. You know, I'm listening to Joelle talk and I'm saying to myself, well, where was I? I have to say that in school, we didn't learn anything about Paul Robeson. So it was a pleasure to read your book. And also I saw you on Book TV on C-SPAN and I was able to hear you talk about all of your books. Um, Dr. Horn has written 31 books. I think that, that you beat everybody, <laughs> especially <laughs> because they're nonfiction books. Um, Dr. Horn, I read that you grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and that you went to undergraduate at Princeton. You earned a law degree at UC Berkeley, and your master's and your PhD are from Columbia University. Um, and again, a prolific writer. What all this information about Paul Robeson, I, I can't wait to share it. I did buy a copy for my branch as well. So Good. <laughs> welcome again and world here, Dr. Horn. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you to the Public Library and the People's Center for arranging this event. I'm very appreciative. Uh, I look forward to returning physically to New Haven. Uh, in fact, I have some research to do there, so I'm sure I'll be returning sooner rather than later. Now, Paul Robeson, born in 1898 in central New Jersey, died in 1976 in Philadelphia. In between, he was a star athlete along the lines of perhaps Michael Jordan or Jim Brown. Uh, he was an actor and singer, uh, perhaps along the lines of a Denzel Washington, for example. And as a lawyer, uh, he was also unparalleled, as suggested by Joel's mention of the riveting petition filed at the United Nations charging the United States government with genocide against black people, driving the US leaders into the dock where it was difficult for them to escape. And of course, he was a political activist. Uh, it's difficult to find anyone who you could compare him to there. He of course was of African descent. His father was a pastor. He matriculated as Joel suggested at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey, although a good deal of his childhood was spent in Princeton, New Jersey, but at that particular moment during the World War I era, approximately a hundred odd years ago, uh, that particular institution was generally barred 
to people of African descent, no matter how stellar their academic credentials. And so he wound up going to the state university, Rutgers, supported by taxpayers' dollars, although Rutgers was hardly that different, even though Black taxpayers were helping to fund and subsidize this particular state institution. Uh, there, he not only was a star pupil, but also a star athlete, excelling in baseball, basketball, track, and football. And from there, he went on to law school at Columbia University in uptown Manhattan, uh, where he again excelled tremendously. And he had the idea of becoming a lawyer, but that particular project was derailed for different reasons. For a short period of time, he was a professional athlete in the National Football League, although it's fair to say that that particular enterprise was not, was not then as gigantic and as affluent as it is today. And he also had difficulty in terms of dodging the ubiquitous Jim Crow uh, that dogged virtually every Black person in North America at that time. He had the serendipity of meeting the woman who became his wife, Eslanda Good Robeson, and they had a partnership until his death, until her death, excuse me, in the 1960s. And she was critical and key to his subsequent evolution and development. That is to say, Robeson had said more than once that if left to his own devices, uh, he would have become perhaps a professor at a small college of languages. Paul Robeson studied languages as a hobby. Uh, he studied languages the way some people study the sports page. And ultimately, he was conversant in dozens of languages and read dozens of languages. Interestingly enough, at one point before giving a concert in Norway at the peak of his popularity, he spent a weekend studying Norwegian so that he could speak to the people there assembled in a language that they could understand because he felt that this was not only a gesture of humanity to speak to people in a language that they could understand, but it was also part ultimately of a political project in the sense that he was trying to suggest the unity of humanity by showing the commonalities between and amongst languages. And also he felt correctly and properly that being multilingual would be quite useful in building solidarity for the anti-Jim Crow movement in the United States. A turning point in Paul Robeson's life comes when his spouse, Aslanda, in a sense, pushes him onto the concert stage where he begins to excel as a singer. But alas, we are talking about a country that was marinating in Jim Crow, and this was not the kind of environment that was conducive to Paul Robeson's development as an artist, not to mention as a personality and individual. And so it was in the early 1920s that he and his spouse migrated across the Atlant Atlantic to London, uh, where they were to live until the late 1930s. And he would have lived there perhaps indefinitely, uh, but for the outbreak of World War II in 1939 in Europe, and he felt that he and his family could be trapped behind enemy lines in London. I'm sure many of you have seen the film of some of the Nazi attacks on London during World War II, forcing many people to live in subways, for example, with these very powerful rockets that were routinely raining down on urban nodes in Britain. 
And so from the 1920s to the 1930s, London was his headquarters. There he became familiar with and conversant with uh, many of the leading personalities of what was then one of the most intellectually vibrant communist parties worldwide, speaking of the Communist Party of Great Britain, which helped to induce in him a desire to study socialism. Of course, he was familiar with not only Rajani Palm Dutt, whose books are still worth reading, uh, the socialist George Bernard Shaw, the award-winning playwright. Uh, some of you are, may be familiar with Pygmalion, on which the subsequent play and musical movie, My Fair Lady, was based. And he also was quite familiar with many of the African exiles who made London a home, including Jomo Kenyatta, the founding father of modern Kenya, and C.L.R. James, the Trinidadian intellectual who he collaborated with on a play in London in the 1930s about the great Haitian revolutionary Toussaint Louverture. Uh, there was a plan in league with the Russian filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein to turn that particular production into a movie uh, with Paul Robeson playing Toussaint. Uh, sadly and unfortunately and tragically, uh, that project did not take flight. But I think it's also fair to say that a turning point in Robeson's life comes in the 1930s. And it comes from two different angles. One, there's the Scottsboro case. Recall that it was in 1931 that nine black youth in Alabama were riding the rails during the height of the incipient Great Depression, and they were accused falsely of sexual molestation of two-year-old American women. They were arrested, jailed, and were on the fast track to being executed like so many Black folks have been railroaded before and since. But what happened was the intervention of the International Labor Defense which had an affiliate in the United States. It was an organization designed to fight, <clears throat> to fight racism, political repression. It was headed by an old friend of his, William Patterson, another black lawyer born in San Francisco circa 1890, and who basically gave up the practice of law to become a full-time organizer in the 1920s for the US Communist Party, which had been organized a few years earlier. It was Patterson who also helped to interest Robeson more directly in terms of radical politics, revolutionary politics, building socialism, etc. The Scottsboro case was important, and Robeson helped to crusade on behalf of the Scottsboro Nine, as they were called, in Europe because the Scottsboro Nine was a significant departure, a turning point, a watershed, in terms of the struggle against Jim Crow, U.S. apartheid, which erupted in the United States post-1865 after the abolition of slavery, the so-called separate but unequal system that mandated everything from separate neighborhoods to separate schools to separate Bibles to be sworn in on in court, to separate cemeteries, some of which I understand still exist. And this global campaign on behalf of the Scottsboro Nine helped to put US Jim Crow, US apartheid in the global spotlight to its detriment, not unlike the global campaign that put South African apartheid in the spotlight post 1948 up until independence in 1994, and this global movement on behalf of Black people set the stage for the eventual retreat of Jim Crow in the 1950s 
a point we will address momentarily. In any case, the understanding by Robeson that the international labor defense had been brought into being, not least by communists, not least by communists in Moscow, helped to attract him to the then Soviet Union, uh, which had come into being, as you may recall, as a result of the revolution in October 1917. Now, this Scottsboro case was important to Robeson's political and ideological development, but also important was a trip that he made to Germany uh, right after Adolf Hitler had come to power in 1933. Uh, there he came face to face with incipient fascism. And I think it's fair to say that from that point forward, Robeson considered himself to be and defined himself as an anti-fascist. And I would like to suggest that in terms of the pathways that we can follow Robeson uh, in 2020, that is certainly a pathway that we should follow because I take it <laughs> that many of you saw that disturbing article uh, in the newspaper the other day from Germany where thousands, including anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, and neo-fascists, uh, stormed the parliament in Germany under the banner of many of them that Trump was their savior, believe it or not. And so in other words, the United States is helping to spur a fascist movement in one of the central homes of fascism speaking of Berlin. In any case, that grueling encounter with fascism in the 1930s was also part of a tour because his next stop was in the Soviet Union. And I should mention at this point, once again, that Robeson was fluent in German. He was fluent in Russian. Uh, his Fluency in Russian, I dare say, was molded by the point and by the fact that the modern Russian language, as some of you may know, uh, was basically birthed by Pushkin, the great 19th century Russian writer who was of partial African descent. In any case, he was lionized in Moscow. He said that uh, he did not feel the bitter wind of racism that was his fate and his plight in his homeland. And this should not have been surprising because uh, unlike many European countries, including his then home base in London, uh, Russia was not as directly implicated, <laughs> to put it mildly, in the uh, heinous African slave trade, uh, which was the lot of many of the Western European countries, and of course, the United States of America. And it was from that uh, soil uh, that this monster of negrophobia and anti-Black racism uh, was grown. He was so taken by the then Soviet Union that he made sure that his son, his namesake, Paul Jr., was educated there. And of course, Paul Jr., who only died a, a few years ago, uh, was fluent in Russian. And in fact, uh, after he came under attack because of his own political leanings, he was able to make a decent living as a translator of technical Russian documents in the United States of America. But there was another journey, too, that helped to shape Paul Robeson's emerging politics. And that is to say, going to Spain in the 1930s as the Spanish Civil War was erupting. Uh, this was a battle between a progressive regime and a military revolt backed by Hitler and Mussolini that ultimately prevailed at great cost. Robeson campaigned tirelessly on behalf of the Spanish progressive movement and it was at that point that he began to make deeper commitments 
to this idea of crusading against fascism and crusading for socialism. Now, thus far, given my remarks, you might think that Robeson <laughs> was a, a full-time political, but actually he was a performer. He made a very good living uh, as a singer and as an actor. Uh, as an actor, his Othello, speaking of the Shakespearean play, was seen as definitive. And also he was a star of the silver screen, although ultimately he decided to abandon movies because he felt that the roles that he was being offered and some of the roles that he ruefully accepted were demeaning and degrading. Uh, you need only look for a prototype at Gone with the Wind, which is still by some measures the highest grossing film in Hollywood history, challenging Star Wars. If you add the inflation factor in terms of what people were paying to get into the theater then, as opposed to a decade or so uh, previously to where we are now. And this of course is a film that justified uh, enslavement of Africans as did that other Hollywood blockbuster from a few decades earlier, The Birth of a Nation, uh, which glorified the Ku Klux Klan. But having said that, one of Robeson's favorite film roles uh, was a role where he acted with Welsh miners. He was always very close to the miners of Wales. And this movie, I dare say, is still worth seeing. As noted, 1939 was the turning point because then quite faithfully, he decided to return to the place of his birth because of the onset of World War II and the fear that he and his family would be trapped behind enemy lines. When he returned to the United States, he then again plunged into politics. Uh, you may know that Robeson was a founder of the Council on African Affairs, uh, which in the 1930s and 1940s until its forced liquidation by the US government in the 1950s was the premier organization campaigning on behalf not only of anti-apartheid, but campaigning on behalf of decolonization of Africa and the Caribbean generally. By 1941, the United States itself was plunged into World War II. And at that particular moment, Robeson and the rulers of the United States, in a sense, were on the same side, in the sense that politics had forced Washington to join an alliance that included Moscow in order to combat not only fascist Italy and fascist Germany, but also Imperial Japan. I should mention parenthetically that it was neither easy nor simple to convince many people, black people not least, that they should make the ultimate sacrifice for this nation, the United States of America, that has subjected them so atrociously to Jim Crow and lynching. At the same time, as I talk about in my book, Facing the Rising Sun, African-Americans, Japan, and the Rise of Afro-Asian Solidarity, for decades, Tokyo had been making overtures to the Black American community under the slogan that Japan was the champion of the colored races. I should say, to broaden the palette, that this particular slogan was also made to the people of India, where it had some resonance, not to mention to the peoples of Southern Africa and Black Americans in the United States. But Robeson campaigned against that particular slogan and helped to convince many Black people that they should throw in their lot in terms of the anti-fascist movement with the idea that defeating fascism would lead to a simultaneous defeat of its close cousin, speaking of Jim Crow, and that forces would be unleashed as a result of this war that ultimately would redound to the benefit of Black Americans since Jim Crow would be forced into a path 
of ultimate erosion, if not liquidation. So Robeson campaigned tirelessly on behalf of the World War II movement. As noted, he was on the same side of Washington, but that began to change when the war ended in 1945. Because as you know, as the war ended in 1945, the United States turned on its erstwhile ally in Moscow, and there begins the purgatory, if not hell, that Robeson was to endure until his expiration approximately three decades later in 1976. Now, what's striking about this entire period is that I recommend for those of you who have the time, and since many of you are in lockdown, I assume you do, to look at some of the Hollywood movies from this period, which you can find on YouTube. For example, Mission to Moscow, which was made at the instigation of President Roosevelt. It's a shamelessly pro-Soviet movie released by Warner Brothers. And of course, it was designed to influence the US population to retreat with regard to the inured anti-communism and anti-Sovietism. But after 1945, the line changed. Robeson refused to change. And therein begins, once again, his path to harassment. A turning point comes again in the post-World War II period when Mr. Roosevelt's successor, Harry S. Truman, a former Klansman, by the way, in, has Robeson in the White House. Robeson is leading a crusade against lynching. And he's denouncing Truman to his face as Truman's face is turning purple. He's denouncing him in no uncertain terms because of US lethargy in terms of addressing forcefully the bane that was lynching. Uh, after that, you begin to see Mr. Robeson's FBI file thicken. You begin to see how there are plots to do him in. At one point, driving from St. Louis to Jefferson City to engage in lobbying in the state of Missouri, someone tampered with his automobile so that it would go off the road, perhaps over a cliff, but this was discovered at, in the nick of time. Already referenced are the concerts that he tried to give in 1949 in Peekskill, New York, on behalf of the organization led by his friend, William Patterson, to raise money for the Patterson-led organization, the Civil Rights Congress, which was dis disrupted by ultra-righteous forces with the authorities, including the police and the state, state police basically looking on passively. Another turning point comes shortly thereafter with the filing of the petition at the United Nations charging the United States with genocide against black people. Patterson and Robeson collaborated directly on this petition, which put the US leaders in the dock it also was a significant factor in convincing those in Washington that the better part of wisdom would be to execute an agonizing retreat from the more egregious aspects of Jim Crow because putting Jim Crow in the spotlight as Robeson was doing basically was calling into question Washington's self-proclaimed reputation of being a paragon of human rights virtue in terms of the ongoing ideological competition with the then socialist camp. How could Washington portray itself as a paragon of human rights virtue as long as US apartheid existed? So unsurprisingly, during the midst of this Red Scare, this Cold War, you saw the US Supreme Court under prodding from the US State Department, by the way, issue the opinion still relevant, Brown versus Board of Education, which said in principle that Jim Crow had to go, although as we know, <laughs> this decision in 1954 was not necessarily implemented the way it should have been. Robeson became a frequent target of congressional inquisitors, 
particularly in Washington at the House Un-American Activities Committee, where he was repeatedly asked if he were a member of the Communist Party. He was repeatedly grilled about his associations with real and imagined communists. But at the same time, you also saw that Robeson's passport had been taken by the US authorities because they feared that he would go abroad and denounce US Jim Crow, which he certainly vowed and pledged to do. And so they decided, that is to say the State Department, that he should not have a passport so he could not earn a living abroad because his income plummeted precipitously from his heyday when it was in the high six figures to the low four figures. Robeson was barely able to hang on, although it's fair to say that he received a modicum of support from the black community. Uh, he was able to perform in certain churches. After all, his brother had a church in Harlem. His father was a pastor too, both part of the AME Zion Church, which is still with us. I should also say that in many ways, these two uh, pivotal developments, the onset of the Red Scare and the Cold War, and this onset of anti-communism, or the escalation of anti-communism, I should say, are still haunting us. I mean, for example, uh, some of you may know that it was during Robeson's lifetime that a deal was cut <laughs> with China that in return for turning against Moscow, uh, they would receive massive inward direct foreign investment, which has now created this juggernaut. The foreign investment from the United States alone might have been in the trillions, believe it or not, not to mention its allies in Europe, Japan, etc. And now, of course, those of you who follow the news know that a major campaign issue promulgated by the Oath in the Oval Office, the Tangerine Man, the Manhattan Mussolini, is a new Cold War against China, which is a direct outgrowth of this Red Scare and the Cold War against Moscow. In other words, the United States, in a sense, went overboard in terms of this obsession with Moscow, which has led to the rise of China. I should mention that uh, in my book just published on the 16th century, I draw an analogy between the fact that one of the reasons we're sitting here speaking English, as opposed to not being here at all, or speaking Spanish or speaking Turkish, the two major powers of the 16th century, is that Turkey and England cut a deal against their mutual foe in Spain, uh, which helped to undermine Spain, but it also put England in the passing lane, allowing it to steal a march on both Turkey and Spain. And here we are now sitting here in North America speaking English of all languages. The other critical aspect that I wanted to mention was that this Red Scare involved a decimation of unions, particularly left-led unions, such as the West Coast Longshore, led by his good friend, Harry Bridges. And so here we have the spectacle of progressive labor being undermined, which therefore helps to handicap the ability of labor to educate the working class, making some sectors of the working class in 2016 imminently susceptible to the viruses unleashed by a dearth of working class and labor education. And so we see that in some ways, what happened to Robeson and what happened to Robeson and his comrades and friends, it's still haunting us today in 2020. Now, there was a global movement to ensure that Robeson's passport would be returned, which ultimately it was in the late 1950s, not surprisingly, as a new anti-Jim Crow movement was erupting in Montgomery, Alabama, as symbolized by Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., helping to introduce more progressive elements into the political scene in the United States, 
And that combined with a global movement, not least spearheaded from India, uh, where Robeson was quite familiar with the leaders, including uh, Nehru, the founding father, and his daughter, uh, Indira Gandhi. And Robeson gets his passport back. He returns to his own stomping grounds in London, but he kind of overdoes it. it it's, it's almost as if you had been starved and someone puts a feast before you. He travels incessantly. Uh, he, of course, visits the Soviet Union, he visits Australia and New Zealand, uh, he's performing, he's acting in Shakespeare in London, and his health begins to decline at the same time that his spouse's health, Asalanda, begins to decline as well. She, of course, was more than a spouse, she was his manager, and has noted in some ways a significant and profound political influence she passes away in the mid-1960s. Robeson decides that he should return back to the United States at that point, which he does, returning to live with his sister uh, at the Robeson home in West Philadelphia, which, by the way, is now sort of a shrine uh, to Robeson. And even though many come to pay their respects to him, He's in virtual seclusion and declining health from that point until his unfortunate passing in early 1976. So to conclude, uh, I should mention that I was just talking to representatives of the Robeson Foundation, which is led by members of his family. And I had suggested to them a number of projects that the foundation could get involved in, which leads me to part of the legacy of Paul Robeson. Uh, it's not only anti-racism, it's not only anti-fascism, it's not only uh, the struggle for socialism, it's not only the struggle for African liberation and Caribbean liberation, it's also a struggle for humanity as represented in his multilingualism, his studying languages as a hobby. And I suggested that part of the continuing legacy of Robeson in the 21st century would not only be reanimating the struggle against fascism, which I'm afraid to say is desperately needed, but also helping to start a movement, a humanitarian movement, to help to ignite in Black youth in particular the idea of multilingualism, of studying various languages. And in that regard, uh, starting a project whereby his still riveting memoir, Here I Stand, would be translated into various languages, not only the languages that you would expect and suspect, you know, where, you know Yoruba, Zulu, uh, I suspect it's been translated into French, uh, Russian, and Germany, uh, German already, but also Native American languages as well, such as Cherokee. So I'll stop at that point. Thank you very much for your rapt attention. And uh, I take it that this is the time for discussion and the like. Dr. Horn, there was a comment from um, Susan Garvey. Interesting, she grew up in Enfield and she graduated Enfield High School 76. And she says in our yearbook, we wanted to include Paul Robeson's Enfield's home as an important historic fact. The Italian family that lived there said we could take picture not, but not mention Robeson's name. So we carved the initials PR on the tree in front of the house to make sure Robeson was noted. I think that's wonderful. It speaks to what happens in Enfield. You know, we as people in Connecticut, who knew? So it's an interesting observation. Here's a woman who uh, brought his legacy to light in high school, which is great. Which leads us to another one, uh, Sarah Siano says, what does Professor Horn think of the lack of labor history in our schools? A case can be made that there is none. I'm talking here about labor in the progressive era. This history, Haymarket Square, et cetera, is nowhere to be found in the high school history classes, as far as I know. We talk about the education process in high school, I think this is wonderful. I mean, labor history, I mean, your thoughts, lack well, of or whatever. I agree with that. I mean, I think it's not only uh, conspicuously absent from high schools, 
believe it or not, is conspicuously absent from many colleges and universities too. And I think you can draw a straight line from that absence to some of the weaknesses that I'm afraid that a good deal of the United States, speaking, I'm speaking to you from Texas, the <laughs> shining buckle of the Bible Belt, as it's oftentimes called, and where labor is considered a kind of four-letter word. Of course, spelling is not their strong suit down here. And I think that this absence of labor history in a country where the overwhelming majority, the 99%, if you will, are overwhelmingly selling their labor for a wage and are therefore part of the working class and are now at least a goodly portion of labor and working people being whipsawed in the midst of this pandemic. I'm sure your audience knows about the disproportionate impact upon the black and brown working class in terms of this pandemic, not only in terms of mortality, but in terms of layoffs as well. Not only that, but some of you may be familiar with these astonishing stories in the United States about wage theft, <laughs> whereby people feel that they're selling their labor for a wage, but somehow they never get their paycheck, which is a form of de facto slavery. And just as in the 19th century, I think that unions came to recognize that it would be difficult to have a vibrant and powerful labor movement as long as you had slavery dragging down wages and working conditions. It's very difficult to compete with a worker who does not get paid if you're in that troublesome position. Believe it or not, in some ways, we're in a similar, at least some of us are in a similar position today. So certainly I salute uh, the questioner with regard to the dire need for labor history, not only in high schools, but in colleges, and also within the union movement as, wor as well, because labor studies and the union movement is something we really have to put on the fast track. Marion, there's a question, Q&A, did you get that? I see the question, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's from, Mal I wanna say Malika Horn. It says, why is fascism still having such a hold on people in this country? And as Dr. Horn mentioned in Germany, not to mention other menaces such as race and gender bias. Well, that's a very good question. Um, and by the way, that's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Did I say her first name right? I hope I'm not outing her. Um, <laughs> but in any case, in a few days, we will mark September 11th. Now, September 11th is not only important for 2001, which I'll mention in a moment, but it's also part of 1973 when the socialist-oriented government in Chile, South America, under Salvador Allende, was overthrown, not least because of intervention by the Nixon-Kissinger cabal collaborating with the Chilean military. This is symbolic of a global trend that helps to explain the rise of fascism. That is to say, just as the left was overthrown in Chile, which like a seesaw led to the rise of the right in fascist movements, this was part of a global trend. You had the coup in Indonesia in 1965, which was similar to the coup in Chile in 1973. You had the United States war in Vietnam, concluding ignominiously in 1975, although it weakened the Vietnamese tremendously. You had the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah, in Ghana, West Africa in 1966. And so there was this obsessional crusade by Washington against left-wing forces. And as left-wing forces declined, inevitably filling the vacuum were these right-wing ultra-rightist forces. And of course, September 11, 2001 is a further exemplar of that. 
because some of you may be old enough to recall that the United States got involved in Afghanistan, at least by the 1970s, when you had a left-leaning regime, but the United States then collaborated with religious zealots, uh, not only Osama bin Laden, but some who made him look like a choir boy. And the left-leaning regime was destabilized and overthrown, leading to religious zealots coming to power. And according to the 9-11 Commission of Congressman Hamilton and Governor Kane, they then provide sanctuary to Osama bin Laden and his forces known as Al-Qaeda, who then execute the attack on New York and Washington, September 11, 2001. So once again, you have the decline of a left-wing movement, not only decline in a passive voice, but the bludgeoning of a left-wing movement, which then leads uh, like a seesaw to the rise of this, these religious zealots and proto-fascist trends. And so I think that that also helps to explain what we're faced with here in the United States of America. Uh, that is to say, once again, that with the bludgeoning of Robeson and his comrades in the 1950s, recall that Robeson in the 1940s might have been the most popular Negro in the United States, if not the world. He was celebrated. He was lionized. But then comes the Red Scare, creating this ideological vacuum, which, as noted, culminates with the rise of the Mussolini from Manhattan, now occupying the Oval Office in Washington. You have a similar process in Germany, where I just made reference to these forces storming the German parliament. Uh, in a very chilling article you can read in yesterday's New York Times. Thousands. And actually, they see Trump as their hero. They, they act, some of them actually went to the US embassy in, in Berlin because they thought that Trump was there to liberate them, believe it or not. I, I kid you not. Uh, some of them are affiliated with QAnon, uh, this growing movement which is sending some of its members to Congress, I'm afraid to say, in a few months, uh, which says that Mr. Trump is fighting a one-man battle against elites in Hollywood, in the Democratic Party, in the universities, in the media, uh, and these elites and their fellow travelers are Satan worshipers and pedophiles. You, some of you may recall the so-called Pizzagate scandal early in the Trump administration where this guy takes this seriously and drives to Washington because he thinks he's going to unmask a Democratic Party a pedophile ring in a pizza parlor. Even official sources have said that they have terrorist leanings. We're all familiar with the militias, some of whom invaded the Capitol in Michigan uh, just a few months ago in April when the Open the Oval Office was tweeting shamelessly liberate Michigan, for example, and denouncing Governor Whitmer of Michigan. Some of you may have seen the stories from Portland, Oregon, of the so-called prayer forces, one of whom was killed, apparently, uh, in the streets. You have respectable forces who are suggesting that the United States is really at the beginning stages of armed conflict within the streets, which could happen as soon as 55 days from now if the election does not go in a direction that some of these forces find appealing. So certainly, I can't think of a better time in which to begin to organize and mobilize and put on our marching shoes. So there's, there's a second question, Dr. Horn. Um, it says, please connect the efforts of Paul Robeson to stop lynching in the 1940s with today's Black Lives Matter movement. How are the attacks on Robeson similar to the attacks on Black Lives Matter? Well, they're very similar. I just got an email the other day about the U.S. authorities in Washington trying to cook up a scheme whereby they can indict leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, those of you who are familiar with this movement know that when it came into existence a few years ago after the slaying of Trayvon Martin in Florida at the hands of George Zimmerman, it thought that it was going to try to avoid what had befallen the Black Panther Party and Robeson's and Patterson's Civil Rights Congress. That is to say, a centralized organization 
whereby the leaders are conspicuous, uh, which makes them then an inviting target for murderous attacks, for jailing, which of course Patterson was subjected to. He was jailed, not to mention Black Panther Party leaders too numerous to mention. Those of you in New Haven, I'm sure, may recall the struggles around the Black Panther Party in New Haven, Connecticut, because I recall going to demonstrations in New Haven about the Black Panther Party. So the Black Lives Matter movement uh, is not a centralized movement. It's a decentralized movement. And so they thought that <laughs> that would help them to evade these sorts of attacks. But no, 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 no. Now somehow they're going to try to cook, cook up a scheme to indict. I don't know who they're going to indict, but you know, stay tuned. But certainly there is a parallel because one of the parallels being that Robeson and Patterson tried to internationalize the struggle against lynching and Jim Crow, as evidenced by the Scottsboro case, as evidenced by the petition to the United, United, United Nations in 1950, 1951. The Black Lives Matter movement has sought to walk in those footsteps, although if I were to be candid, I would say they have not been as effective in the international arena as the Robeson Patterson forces which is unfortunate because some of you may know that it was in June 2020 that the African Union uh, filed a petition at the Human Rights Council of the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, calling for a, quote, commission of inquiry, unquote, into, quote, systemic racism, unquote, in the United States of America. The United States delegation, of course, played it cool, but in some ways they were like the duck, duck on the pond that seemingly is going along the pond in a very placid manner, but beneath the surface, they're paddling furiously. And so Washington's delegation was twisting arms like madmen in Geneva. And so the petition did not take flight, but that will not end the attempt, I dare say, to internationalize this question of police terror because there are too many cases you already know about the demonstrations in New Zealand, Australia, London, Germany, et cetera, in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. You might have noticed that just a few days ago, the Secretary of State, the morally corrupted Michael Pompeo, has sought to impose sanctions on the International Criminal Court. And I dare say that even though supposedly that's because of the ICC's investigation into U.S. war crimes in Afghanistan, perhaps in the back of his mind is the possibility that if he is not careful, he and his immediate supervisor, Agent Orange himself in the Oval Office, might find themselves in the dock in The Hague. Certainly, if justice prevails, that will take place. And so, yes, I think that there are many parallels to be drawn between the anti-lynching movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. But interestingly enough, if you look at the anti-lynching movement, oftentimes the thrust of the complaint was against posses and gangs mm -hmm. who would organize these ceremonies even, whereby black people would be lynched, executed. What's interesting is that even though <laughs> with the rise of Ronald Reagan, you had a weakening of the public sector, the government, and the rise of the private sector under neoliberalism. With regard to lynching, you've had, in a sense, the opposite. You've had the decline of the private sector as being the major vectors of our executions, and the rise of the public sector, police forces, death row, the fact that Black people were probably the most heavily incarcerated people on planet Earth, a disproportionate rate of incarceration. And so certainly, once again, we have a lot of work to do if we are to escape this pestilence that is neo-fascism. Dr. Ron, we have uh, in, from chat, uh, what are your thoughts about the fact, this is from Leona, your thoughts about the fact that on uh, May 29th, 1919, over 100 years ago, Paul Robeson, approximately age 21, submitted a senior thesis called The 14th Amendment, The Sleeping Giant of the American Constitution, 
to Rutgers University. Have you read the thesis? Thank you in advance. Yes. The 14th Amendment is a sleeping giant, <laughs> but I'm afraid to say it's part of another pattern whereby movements such as the abolitionist movement, the anti-slavery movement, oh, and a footnote. I, I just saw, um, as you know, um, Hollywood is like many businesses is going through many changes and disruptions with theaters being shut down, and now slowly reopening. So a, a number of movies are being dumped into Netflix that might have gotten a theatrical debut. I just saw a, a Netflix disc, Emperor, about the John Brown movement. You recall mm -hmm. John Brown, 1859, that tries to lead a movement to overthrow slavery. And it focuses on one of the uh, black leaders of his outfit, uh, Shields Green. It, it, it's, it's interesting, I, I recommend it. It's called Emperor. In any case, this abolitionist and anti-slavery movement and the movement um, involving reconstruction is able to pass the 14th Amendment, which among other things calls for a reduction <laughs> of the congressional delegation of these states in Dixie that deprive Black people of voting rights. And of course, in some ways, that's replicated by the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which in some ways is the beginning of the right to the franchise of Black people in many states. And of course, ultimately, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is expanded, making for bilingual ballots, ballots in certain jurisdictions in Vietnamese, Chinese, Spanish, etc. but then was gutted uh, under the Hand, handiwork of Chief Justice John Roberts approximately seven years ago in the Shelby County case. And interestingly enough, uh, if you study the jurisprudence of John Roberts, which I would not recommend unless you have a problem with insomnia and mm. <laughs> looking for a way to fall asleep, two of his major obsessions are A, anti-affirmative action, anti-voting rights, or what used to be called anti-Negro, and B, as represented by the cases in June of this year, uh, giving these evangelical Christians more rights. And of course, that's the base of the Republican Party coalition. Those are the foot soldiers, despite the scandals, uh, which you might have heard about involving Jerry Falwell Jr., since I assume there are children on this call, I won't go into detail about some of the scandals he was involved in. But in any case, these recent cases, of course, uh, give these religious institutions the right to fire uh, those who do not subscribe to their theology, uh, fire them willy-nilly, basically, or alternatively, the hospitals that are supposedly uh, sponsored by religious bodies to deprive women of contraceptives on the basis that that's part of religious liberty. So Robeson was quite prescient with this Rutgers University dissertation because the 14th Amendment in some ways as it evolved, particularly in the 50s and 1960s, became a kind of Magna Carta. It became the wellspring that helped to provide constitutional underpinnings uh, for anti-Jim Crow measures, as he envisioned in this dissertation. So in some ways, the sleeping giant began to awake from his slumber in the 1960s before grabbed by the neck by these right-wingers on the U.S. Supreme Court, who then began to try to suffocate the sleeping giant with a pillow of right-wing ideology. So there's another question from Gloria. It says, please discuss the fear and or failure of the black elite to use their influence and affluence to make major social changes in America today. What are the commonalities and differences between now and the black elite during Robeson's time? It's a very complicated question. First of all, with regard to Robeson's time, uh, to its everlasting discredit, uh, 
I'm afraid to say that the NAACP leadership did not stand beside Robeson, nor did they stand beside W.E.B. Du Bois, their founder. Mm -hmm. uh, the first book I wrote was on how Du Bois had returned to the NAACP in 1944 during the progressive era of anti-fascism, but was sacked ignominiously in 1948 as the Red Scare and Cold War were taking flight. And the NAACP made the decision that in, in return for anti-Jim Crow concessions, that they would put distance between themselves and people like Du Bois and Robeson and William Patterson. Um, and subsequently, you know, you had certain NAACP leaders uh, who even went so far as to support the war in Vietnam, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. But it's complicated because ultimately the black elite, when you had the, the anti-Jim Crow movement, basically, Effectively, what it did is that it allowed more black people to enter sectors of the working class and of the middle class and of the middle strata that theretofore had been barred to them. Generally speaking, black people have not been, shall we say, integrated successfully into the U.S. ruling class. And as a footnote, some of you might recall the story of Robert Smith the Cornell University alumnus, a, a billionaire, software mogul, who spoke at the Morehouse College graduation ceremony some months ago and pledged to pay off the debt of all Morehouse College students. Mm -hmm. There was a squib in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago, <laughs> excuse me for giggling because it's not funny, that suggested he's now in the criminal investigation. Now, I would like to think that that does not have anything to do with his philanthropy, but I think it does illustrate the perils of what happens to those black Americans who are climbing the greasy pole towards elite status is not as if they are not subjected to racism, <laughs> for example. As a matter of fact, I'm about to publish a book on, on uh, boxing, for example. <laughs> And one, one of the themes in this book, for those of you who know anything about boxing, is how, um, so you have this uh, morally corrupt Don King, who is a boxing promoter, who's made millions, he's made a small fortune, but is always under investigation, always reviled in the press, and then, you have his competitors, such as Bob Arum, who is not black American, who basically gets a pass. So the, the black American elite is in a very difficult position. But having said that, I, I was struck by the fact that a member of the Congressional Black Caucus said the other day that he wanted to have a word with Joe Biden because supposedly Joe Biden, under pressure from the left, said that he was going to try to keep Wall Street types out of his administration. And this member of the Congressional Black Caucus said he went to reprimand uh, Joe Biden for making that declaration. Now I was saying, well, on whose behalf is he speaking? I mean, it's not like there are many black people on Wall Street that, whose interests he has to protect, but obviously he's getting campaign donations. And then in, in terms of, of another kind of elite, uh, I, I've oftentimes raised this and I'll raise it here. Many students struggle to have African-American studies at Yale and, for example, at Harvard, for example. Harvard African-American studies paid a pretty penny to another Ivy League scholar to give a series of lectures, then published in a book that made the claim that despite the three-fifths clause of the U.S. Constitution, despite the fugitive slave clause, which called upon states that did not necessarily have as many slaves to return enslaved Africans to South Carolina and Georgia, despite the fact that the slavery-driven, constitutionally mandated electoral college may be on the verge of allowing the oath in the Oval Office to lose the popular vote by six million votes, but yet win in the, the electoral college, which is slavery-driven. And supposedly the, the Constitution is an anti-slavery document, this is sponsored by Harvard African American Studies, believe it or not. So people, students struggle <laughs> to have 
nonsense and propaganda being published, apparently. So I have to say, as the skein of my remarks tends to su suggest, I'm rather torn uh, when it comes to an analysis of, of the black elite, just like the black elite is torn. Now, they're torn because on the one hand, of course, they're trying to climb the greasy pole to success in this exploitative society. But on the other hand, if, if they're driving their Mercedes in the wrong neighborhood on a Saturday night, they can be shot too, which then helps to propel them in a progressive direction. So it's, it's, it's a very contradictory phenomenon that we're facing. So this is a question that you're not going to like. No. Um, it's from Nakisha Jones. It says, do you think Kamala Harris played a role in mass incarceration in California, in California during her time as AG? How do you believe Robeson would feel about her candidacy for <laughs> vice president? <laughs> well, I, I, the, the second part of the question I can answer easily because, uh, you know, I used to be a lawyer and as lawyers say, objection, the, the answer is <laughs> called speculation. <laughs> um, but in any case, you have, I'm very familiar with California. I used to live there. And, and I assume that most of the people I'm speaking to are in Connecticut. And because of the aforementioned electoral college, I don't feel in the presidential election is 50 different races. You can lose the popular vote and, and still win. So I think I can be a, a bit more forthcoming. Uh, with regard to what I'm about to say, and even with regard to California, Hillary Clinton won California by almost 3 million votes. Uh, and of course, won the popular vote by a, a similar amount and still lost. But certainly, uh, Senator Harris uh, has been criticized uh, in California. Interestingly enough, when she became district attorney of San Francisco, he defeated the son of Vincent Helena, a lion of the left who ran for president with ropes and support in 1952 on a progressive party ticket with his vice president being the first black woman to run for vice president, Charlotte Bass, mm -hmm. who we need to know more about. Mm -hmm. But in any case, when she ran against Helena the Younger, she was basically running to his right. And in, in some ways, this, 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 but running to, your, to the right in San Francisco does not mean being on the right. <laughs> this means you're running to the right of people who are influenced by socialism and by the Green Party, et cetera, which was Helen and the Younger. And certainly when she took the position, she was criticized for her policies with regard to truancy, for example, which many people felt was too draconian towards parents and was not sufficiently sensitive to parents' dilemmas when they have to work and their children may be truant, that is to say, not going to school. Uh, she was criticized for her policy with regard to marijuana, which eventually she changed, of course, and of course brought a rebuke from her estranged father in Jamaica uh, when she joked about being Jamaican and being all too familiar with marijuana. She was criticized as attorney general uh, for um, some of the deals she made with then Mr. 1% himself, Steve Mnuchin, and some of his banking antics and escapades, which people felt that the attorney general of San Francisco, A.G. Harris, should have been more vigilant about cracking down on. So yes, there is a critique to be made. Although if you look at the right-wing press nowadays, I was looking at a column by Kathleen Parker who writes for the Washington Post. And she's one of these never Trumper Republicans, and, and, which is another story, I wanna digress on that. But in any case, she was saying that Senator Harris had a more left-leaning record in the Senate than Bernie Sanders, according to Kathleen Parker in the Washington Post. So there you have it. I don't see any more questions. Uh, anybody in the audience? We're getting close to 8.30. Oh, let's see. Oh, this is good, hold on. <laughs> 
We got some. Oh, this is, wait a minute. It said, let's see. I'm oh, sorry. It says, according to Paul Robeson Jr. on January 16th, 1965, at Black Playwright Lorraine Hansberry's funeral by Paul Robeson Jr., Malcolm X requested a meeting with Paul Robeson Sr. Um, Paul agreed to meet with Malcolm. However, meeting did not happen because Malcolm was murdered. What do you think Malcolm X wanted to talk about with Paul Robeson? Perhaps another petition to the United Nations about mistreatment of Negroes slash black people by powers that be in US. Thank you in advance. So. Well, yes, I, I would assume because Malcolm X, as you know, was in the process of trying to have liftoff in his organization of Afro-American unity. And one of the ideas was a revival of the petition to the United Nations, an, an idea that is still uh, with us. And certainly as noted, the African Union, per the June 2020 petition I just mentioned, has given us a wonderful opportunity to try to walk in the footsteps of Paul Robeson. I should also mention, to connect the previous question, that in the New York Amsterdam News, the black paper in uh, Harlem, um, it may be the current issue or it may be the issue before that, there was a front page article about how Kamala Harris's father, after Malcolm X was assassinated, uh, wrote an article in the Gleaner, which as you know is the paper in Jamaica, a sort of laudatory article about uh, Malcolm X. And it's, it's, a very, it's, it's a very, it's on the front page, so it won't be that hard to, to, uh, to locate. And as you know, um, Mr. Harris, or Professor Harris, excuse me, uh, was, had been a, was the first black member of the economics department at Stanford. Uh, and of course, was something of a left-leaning intellectual, to put it mildly. And uh, I, I recommend that, that article in Amsterdam News to your audience. What date was it, Dr. Horn? It was either, it's either the current issue or the week before. I just read it okay. a few minutes. Okay, thanks. Um. Marion, do you have any other questions or how are we? Anything? Your, your microphone's off. I don't see any more questions, but this was really fascinating. I Excellent. just, great. Thank you so much. I just want to share this. Sorry, I, just, I meant I want to share the screen. We have to give our little PSA to the library and people center for everybody. Just take note if you want to contact one minute. Oops. Okay, I'm going to share. So we can. So anybody you're interested in getting uh, contact with the library or um, the People Center, um, and let's see, how do we unshare now? Oh boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's hard. Um, you can just leave here. the light. I still see your face. <laughs> Uh, hmm. Let me see. Wait a minute. Oh, God. I'll tell you a second. Well, okay. This is not. It's the end of this. Oh, oh, stop share. Sorry about that. I'm just oh. getting used to. Okay. This, okay. This is great. It's 62. I'm just figuring out Zoom. So, okay. Thanks. Um, on behalf of the library and Amiri Private Station, it's, it's been such a great honor to have you. And. Uh, I'm looking forward to your John Howard Lawson book because I was interested in how Hollywood 10. And if we, if COVID lasts forever, we have all 31 of your books, keep people a lot very busy reading. And uh, <laughs> we hope to have you back, Marion. I don't know if you want to say anything about your book club and maybe. Oh, we're reading uh, by David Chariandi. I recommend everybody read it. I think I have a picture of it. This is a beautiful book. Um, David Chariandi, did, Seth, I don't know if you remember, he got the Wyndham Campbell Prize. I want to say- I remember, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, the book is wonderful. It's so lyrical. It's not that long. And let me see, less than 200 pages. And um, we could all read it by Saturday. Saturday at noon is our book discussion. I just put my email in the chat. So if anybody wants the Zoom link, 
get in touch with me or with Seth. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Sure. I'm glad to see we have somebody, Eric Gordon, who was from New Haven and he went to Mitchell Library. So I just want to say, I think we're connecting with everybody all over the United States, which is wonderful. Um, that we can, and that's the great thing about Zoom. It's great, it was wonderful to have you in person. I mean, that's, but I, I don't think we ever. Great. It's great, it's fabulous. So there is that positive Zoom feature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still figuring it out. And thanks again, and everybody, uh, again, thank you for coming. And.